Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? This is Dr. Vong here, world famous bariatric surgeon, author of 13 books, but you know that. We're gonna, this is our nice, kind COVID community. We're here to talk about the facts of COVID and the coronavirus. No BS, no hype, no trolls. So do me a favor. Tell me where you're watching from. Hashtag replay. You can fast forward to about the five minute mark and then I'll get started. Today, we are going to talk about uh, how COVID is not just about the death rate. If you have friends or loved ones who say, you know, this COVID thing, it's all overblown. Not that many people have died. More people have died from heart disease and obesity. See, they used to say the influenza, the regular flu. Now they realize, nope, it's not the regular flu. More people die from coronavirus, you know? So what we want to do is uh, tag or share this for me real quick. We'll get some people in here. We'll say hello. Oh, man, lots of comments already coming in. Appreciate that. Where, uh, where are you watching from? Georgia's in the house. Navajo Nation, get out of town. Stay safe. You guys were really sick there for a while. Way to, way to make a comeback. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Emily. How are you guys doing? We're going to talk about, you know, COVID beyond complications beyond just death. There's a lot more happening. Hey, Lisa. Missouri's in the house. What's up? Whoop, whoop. All right, ATL. Oh my gosh, Dorota Lemmings from UK. All right, what's up? Oh, there's another UK. Bernice Holder from the UK. How amazing. We are international, everybody. Oh no, nobody cares about Albuquerque. Just kidding. Heather Mitchell from Phoenix is in the house. Lots of people. That's awesome. Montana's in the house. What's up? Uh, Australia, hold on. Australia's in the house. <laughs> awesome. What's up, Cheryl? How's it going? She's in my challenge. Nadine, CST Fast from South Carolina. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Two more minutes. We'll get started. We're going to talk about all the other complications uh, that come with coronavirus beyond just death. You guys are going to be really surprised by some of these. Uh, some of you guys are still going, uh, going through this right now. Super important we hit share, super important. Germany's in the house. What's up, Jules? Hope you're doing good. New Orleans is on fire again, Eldon. You know, this is gonna have long standing effects. Coronavirus is gonna have long standing effects, way more than just death, all right? So I don't mean to be gloom. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna talk about, you know, this is not fear mongering. Hey, Melody, I just want you to understand what you're going through, Velver. Okay, I want you to understand, Ana Luisa, um, what your friends and loved ones might be going through. So wanna make sure we share this. Um, real quick, let me ask you a question and then we'll get started in one minute, one minute to go. Have you yourself personally been affected with coronavirus? Go ahead and comment, how did you feel? What was it like? And what we'll do is, good morning, Robin, evening, Robin. What we'll do is we wanna talk about, there's Queensland, we want to, um, you know, give you a little bit of positive energy if you have suffered from uh, coronavirus. And we're going to get started here in 30 seconds. Not yet. Stay safe. Stay safe. Good. Hello, everybody. See, we are an international community. I love that. Hit share. Let's get this all over the world. Let me have a swig of water and we'll get, we'll get started. Ah. Uh. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Duckwell, world famous bariatric surgeon, author of 13 books. I've been doing my kind coronavirus series. We are a kind coronavirus community. We don't want to talk about the hype, the fear mongering. We don't want to deal with trolls. We just want to come together as a community and get through this so we can go back to our new normal. I'll talk about new normals at a later time. It's, it ain't going back to the way it was. Am I right? Come on now. If you're hoping it's going to go back, then you're missing out. Today, we're going to talk about uh, how coronavirus is more than just a death count. I know the news loves the death count. The, new, the news loves the coronavirus cases. But I'm here to tell you that coronavirus is going to have a bigger toll on us beyond just the death count, right? It's going to have serious implicating side effects. And we're starting to see that. And some things that people 
kind of intuitively know is going to happen. And then a few surprising things that we're going to talk about. Now, why should you listen to a bariatric surgeon? I am a weight loss surgeon. Reason why is what's the number one risk factor for poor outcomes with obesity? Anyone know who remembers the number one risk factor for poor outcomes if you come down with COVID? It's obesity. So it's my following. That's why I'm doing these coronavirus videos. I spent years building up this following and I have a voice and that voice is to help us get over all of this. My following is the number one patient demographic that's being affected by this disease. Okay. Now obesity doesn't, doesn't make you catch it, but it gives you poor outcomes if you do catch it. So we want to make sure you stay healthy, right? Okay. So if you survive, and then today's going to be kind of like a depressing, morbid talk, man. It's not happy, but we want to really talk about what's, what's, what people are experiencing. So if you've had coronavirus, I'd love it if you would put a comment down and kind of explain your experience. Kind of tell people that this is not hoax. This is not hype. This is real. If you're a nurse or a doctor or in the hospital, an aide, a tech, kind of uh, comment with your experience. What are you seeing down there in Houston and Miami and New Orleans and the, the, the hot belt? You know, what was it like there in Phoenix and LA? Okay. We know the stories of New York city and New Jersey, and we got past those, but we're about to have to relive that. Okay. Um, good news is we've started to plateau. Uh, we're not sure we're going back down yet, but we are getting it under control. Now by under control, I mean, we are still having 65,000 cases a day, every single day, 65, 64, 63,000. Those are a lot of cases. And with those cases is going to increase, um, include increased hospitalization, which then a certain percentage of that will go on to ICU. And so we need to keep doing what we're doing. And the way that I find that's most effective uh, of this uh, is to share the broadcast if you find value share your story, make this human, make this not be about the news or hype or conspiracy theory, but about real people. So I would love it if you would share your story or a story of a loved one and, and someone real close to you, not somebody that you heard about the news, etc. And as always, I will take your questions uh, in about 15 to 20 minutes when I'm done with my talk. Okay. So let's get started. All right. So we know that coronavirus um, is what's called a novel, which means new, new coronavirus. So there is no immunity to this virus. We're all going to catch this virus at some point. Now there's a virus and then there's the host. Okay. Both play a role. How, how much virus did you get? That's called the viral load. I'll do another video on that. And then the host, what type of host are you? Are you young and healthy or are you older and sicker with comorbidities? right? They will have a combination. And there's, you, there's four squares you can think about. Low, vir low viral load, high viral load, right? Um, young and healthy, old and sick. And you can have different combinations. If you're old and healthy, I mean, old, if you're older, but you don't, you didn't have a very heavy viral load, you might not have really bad symptoms. On the other hand, if you're young and healthy, if you're young and healthy, but you've had a lot of viral load, you might end up having a worst case. Okay. And that worst case means you might go to the ICU. Okay. And half of the patients who end up in the ICU used to be used to, I think it's gotten better. They would end up needing the ventilator. Now a lot has changed. This is called science. You guys are seeing the scientific uh, method uh, happening right before your eyes. Uh, we used to try to put patients on ventilators early. Uh, we used to use PEEP, uh, that's positive in, uh, expiratory pressure, uh, to help you kind of just keep your little uh, lung sacs called alveoli open. It's just a little extra little push of air at the very end. We think that might cause more trauma. Uh, we try to save the ventilators for kind of the last ditch effort. Uh, we try to do different things like putting patients on their back uh, starting the dexamethasone and, and um, remdesivir early, right? Um, so these are new treatments that your doctors 
uh, have. But as we know, there will be a uh, continued death rate. Now, the case fatality rate currently in the United States is about 7%. Seven. And it's not one. It's not 0.01. It's not a little bit tougher than the flu. It is 7%. The average uh, fatality rate for the seasonal flu is about 0.1% or less. 0.1% or less. So a 1% death rate is uh, 100 is 10 times more, right? 0.1. So 1% death rate would be would be 10 would be um, 10 times more. So this is 7%. So it's going to be 70 times more deadly. 70 times more deadly currently. That will that might go down as uh, some of the patients who aren't recovered yet. They either they don't have an outcome. They'll either recover or they'll pass away and they'll go into the mix, okay? But the current death rate as of July 29th today, you know, is about six and a half to 7% in the United States. Um, some of the European countries where a lot of their cases have resolved, we see that France, for example, had one of the highest case fatality rates, 20% at one point, and it's slowly dropping down 19, 18, but I, uh, last time I checked, it was still in the high teens. Okay, so it's still it's still a lot higher than seasonal flu. So no more of this seasonal flu BS. Not true. Um, I haven't looked at England, the United Kingdom recently, but at one point they were in the 10, 11, 12 percent range uh, for case fatality rate, and a lot of their cases have resolved. So that number might have gone down, but it is way higher than the 0.1% of the seasonal flu. So this is a bad bug. It's much worse than seasonal flu. Uh, and we're gonna explain why here right now. So a lot of people, you've had the seasonal flu. It's very common. It happens every year. It's about to happen again. In fact, I just, I did a video, it's on YouTube, about why the uh, coronavirus will be even worse in the, in the fall. And it has to do with the timing of the seasonal flu also. But we've had the seasonal flu. We feel like crap for a few days, body aches, fever, things like that. But then we recover and we go back to life as normal. Am I right? Yes. You've had the flu. We've all had the flu. Problem is with the coronavirus, there seems to be some lasting effects that we need to know about. And this gives us another reason to try to avoid uh, catching the coronavirus and doing the masking, social distancing, hand washing, uh, Clorox wipes, and all that good stuff, right? It is not a insult to your civil liberties to mask up. Trust me, it just brings out your eyes. You have beautiful eyes, Stephen. Just wear a mask, okay? Your eyes are pretty. <laughs> Um, it, you know, it's all right. It's all right. So what are some of these other lasting longer side effects? Okay. Comorbid, these morbidities. So, uh, one is very easy for y'all to understand. This is a respiratory illness. It's a lung illness. Uh, worst case scenario, we treat you with a breathing tube. Okay. Uh, and what that leads to is possible permanent long-term lung damage. We don't know the percentages yet. We have a ballpark idea based on, you know, SARS or MERS, you know, um, the first times. But now we have a lot more patients that are being uh, affected, a lot more patients that have been intubated. So I predict we'll see a lot more permanent lung damage from COVID-19, okay? Um, this can be devastating for someone who had previous history of pulmonary disease, such as COPD or poorly controlled asthma or restrictive lung disease, anything like that, okay? Uh, being intubated for a long time, especially with this picture of COVID, bilateral pneumonias, ARDS, uh, that can lead to a lot of lung tissue scarring. But Dr. Vong, I don't have that. I don't have those bad lung problems. Will the same thing happen to me? Maybe. Because remember what I said, you can be young and healthy, but if you have a heavy viral load, boom, you'll get really sick. 
and you might temporarily need a breathing tube. And what we're seeing are previously strong, young, healthy men and women who used to be athletes, runners, joggers, and now have a really hard time just getting around. Yeah. Comment if you know somebody like that. Comment if you know someone who used to be athletic and fit and now are really having a hard time um, getting around. Okay. So number one problem is the continued lung disease, worsening lung disease. We, we've studied patients with uh, the swine flu, for example, the SARS, H1N1, and we know that a lot of them, um, if they survive it, will have persistent lung disease and that might require uh, long-term oxygen, for example. So that's, a, that's an issue that we need to be concerned about because now we're talking about a heavy case load, the hospitals are pushed the max, this virus isn't going away. It's gonna be one long pandemic. In fact, I, I taught you the, a new word the other day, endemic, which means it's just in the community. So it's gonna be constantly pushing our hospital resources. We are low on um, oxygen and things like that. And people can't get discharged home because they can't get oxygen for people at home. So that would be a good business for anybody who wants to go into. But now you're gonna have this whole population of people who survive. See, I told you it wasn't that bad. It was all, all hype because you know death rate's low. But now you have a friend or a cousin who is maybe 35, 40 years old, who um, is now disabled because they need uh, daily constant oxygen, okay? So permanent pulmonary damage. Number two, um, I'm gonna go through, through the organ systems. Number two, we know, we know um, that this virus will, have, will cause heart issues, heart issues, okay? It's, uh, it's called a myocarditis. That's an inflammation of the lining around your heart. Why it does this, we're not completely sure. But um, a new study that came out looked at 100 patients and they have ventricular, that's the strong pumping part of your heart uh, that pushes the blood, that last push out uh, of your heart into the body. Um, that's called the ventricular functioning. It 78% um, of patients have ventricular issues, decreased ventricular issues. And they can see this on a imaging study called a cardiac magnetic resonance, CMR. So they actually look at how the heart's pumping and it seems to be damaged in about 78% of patients who are recovered. Um, this is a very small study. It might not hold true in the long term, but we are seeing more and more reports of heart related issues, right? And um, obviously age matters for this. And, but a lot of the patients, check this shit out. A lot of the patients did not have any heart conditions prior to COVID and now they do, okay? So there is truth to the stories you hear about heart damage, some sort of heart damage after COVID. We are seeing number three, some hopefully temporary kidney issues. So this goes along with um, the sepsis that happens when you get overwhelmed by COVID. Uh, your kidneys might shut down and temporarily you might need to be put on dialysis. And that dialysis is to clear all the toxins out of your body uh, that normally your urine and your kidneys would be doing, but you can't because their kidneys are shutting down. So some patients can get discharged with, um, uh, with dialysis, uh, either outpatient or at home. Um, and most patients, the good news is most patients uh, will recover, will recover. Now, what we're trying to follow out is to see the level of damage to the kidneys. Uh, will your kidneys be functioning at 50%, which you're fine to live on kidneys functioning at 50%. Uh, a lot of people do, but we just, these, this is things that you need to take care of that, we, that are, have lasting effects if you catch COVID, all right? And imagine if you're a young person, imagine if you're only in your 40s and you have heart condition, or um, kidney conditions, okay? 
Number four, um, we are seeing the blood clot issues, right? And hopefully they're temporary. And if they're not too bad, you'll get over them. But these are things that patients need uh, treatment for, possibly anticoagulation long-term, or at least for a couple of years, you might end up having blue tips to your fingers. You might uh, have blue toenails, to toes. Um, if the blood clot is bad enough, you might end up needing amputations um, of the uh, toes or the fingers or the digits, right? So uh, more, more to come on uh, that sort of complication. Now, let me get to some of the um, more ICU-related ICU syndromes. So that's called the post-intensive care syndrome, PICS PICS. Um, what we do know from studying a lot of ICU patients, um, they're, what number, what, are, what number am I? That was four, I think I'm on five. So um, de de debilitation, so muscle wasting. That's from being in the ICU for a long time. And you can have you have muscle breakdown while you're lying in bed, you know, and um, this will take time to rebuild. You will a lot of patients will need physical therapy of some sort, especially if they're uh, older or if they've had a particularly long course. Can you imagine being in the ICU for 60, 70, 90, 100 days? You're going to have atrophy of your muscles they will break down and it will take time to build this up now why is that important well it's one thing to say it's grandma who's 80 years old who has this but what if it's you know your father what, what if it's a young person your son who's 35 years old and is the breadwinner of the family that's going to take a, a toll on things so there's prolonged muscle wasting and, and rehabilitation that's going to be needed uh, a new uh, a new one that you guys probably hear a lot of, which is this brain fog. You have this brain fog. You can't seem to focus. You can't seem to remember where you are um, going into the room for, what you went to the grocery store for. You can't seem to focus on your work. And again, this has major implications if you have to go to work and, you're, and your job requires a lot of mentation, you know, um, and what are the lasting effects of this? We're not sure. We're not sure yet. We're not sure if you'll recover or you'll or if you'll already if you'll always have kind of like memory lapses. We're not we're not sure yet. Why did this happen, Dr. Vong? Um, again, we think that it's probably due to the inflammation of the lining around your brain called meninges. And that's a condition called meningitis which is like you can get bacterial meningitis or viral meningitis that causes inflammation. Um, you often hear about you know, bacterial meningitis, for example. Uh, but one of the lasting effects of that can be where you have this kind of lack of focus, this brain fog, can't get clear, can't, can't remember, right? So brain fog, that's a major one. Um, but I think one of the new ones that you're gonna start hearing about soon, especially as we get get oh get uh, get over this pandemic <laughs> you're going to have what i call covid induced chronic fatigue covid induced chronic fatigue you're going to see a lot of people that are just tired uh we're hearing reports of people who are 100 120 days uh post negative coronavirus test and they're still tired. They still can't seem to, to do all the things they need to do. They're still not quite ready to go back to work. They're just really, really fatigued, right? And it comes with a little bit of shortness of breath and a little bit of just can't really, you know, catch my breath. I'm just tired. Um, that, that also comes with uh, some sleepiness, like just this overwhelming sense of I'm just, I just need to go lay down. I just need to go take a nap, right? Chronic fatigue, coronavirus-induced chronic fatigue. Next one, um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we know that patients who spend a lot of time in the ICU, and we're hearing stories now, suffer PTSD. They recall uh, being on the ventilator. They recall, or or they lose a gap, but but you know the stress 
of the whole situation can lead to nightmares and regrets of PTSD, you know. Um, why am I telling you guys about this? This is depressing. Well, a couple of reasons. One, we need to get everybody to understand it's not just a death rate. You know, there are lasting complications to this uh, COVID. We need these people to get on the same page with the rest of us and start masking up. How much is it to ask for you to just put on a mask, right? A face shield if you can't breathe, you know, gel, wash your hands, social distance, carry some hand sanitizer, some Clorox wipes, wipe down your, your doorknobs, your steering wheels, your car doors, right? So we can get past this, right? That's one. We got to all get on the same page because it's not just about the death rate. And then number two, um, you need to know this because what if it's your husband or your wife who catches this? What if it's your son or your daughter and now they can't go back to work? Maybe your husband catches it and he was a breadwinner for the family. And now you guys are worried about how you're going to pay for the bills. Oh, Dr. Vaughn, we'll get to that point when we get there. Dude, you can't think like that you know, I'm here to tell you, you've been warned. I don't know. This is very similar to like when your dad said, Hey, look both ways before you cross the street and your whole life, you look both ways before you cross the street. Now all the health experts, Dr. Fauci and everybody is saying, Hey, you can have some serious outcomes from this. You can have some serious lasting effects of this virus. Oh yeah. But somehow we blow it off. Yeah, just open her up. No big deal. Most people survive. Yeah, most people do survive. You're right. But there's going to be a very large percentage of people who will continue to be debilitated for this for a long time. Forever? I didn't say forever. Will they overcome this? Maybe, eventually. But these are things that we need to be prepared for because it's, it's our loved one, right? So if you like this talk and found it helpful, I ask that you uh, hit share for me and tag some people for it. Uh, we got to all get on the same page. We got to get up into, you know, all on the same page so we can get over this. And as always, I'll edit this down and put it on my YouTube channel where you can watch the edited down version and share that also. All right. And with that, I will bid you adieu and I will take uh, about 10 minutes worth of questions. And I would, I've been traveling for, um, you know, last couple of days, I haven't been home in over a month and there's a lot of cleanup I've got to do. So my garden's gone crazy. Um, I'm also launching my challenge this week. Oh, if you don't know, I have this uh, weight loss challenge. You don't have to have had weight loss surgery, but we've been preparing for coronavirus uh, for uh, several months now. And I've been giving them these updates and uh, we've been doing things like weekend exercises. We've been doing things like breathing, trying to get our lungs uh, improved. We've been talking about nutrition to try to improve our immune system. Uh, this is all in the challenge. And uh, we've been talking about our, getting our money straight so that when this economy downturns that we don't get blindsided. We've been talking about getting your mind straight so that the stress of everything doesn't get to you of the coronavirus. So we do a lot with the mind state. We do a lot of meditation. We do a lot of gratitude journaling. We are a community that supports each other. That's called the challenge. I only open it up um, at the end of each month and it, it actually opens up tomorrow for enrollment. If you wanna check that out, it's uh, weightlosschallenge.com. You can check that out, weightlosschallenge.com. And uh, I'll tell you more about it this weekend. Um, let me just type that down here real quick and we can put that up there. Oh, I think I might need to do the WW. So, um, check that out and let me take some questions from you. And the enrollment actually doesn't open up until tomorrow, but, uh, you can check it out, see what it's all about. There are a lot of patient testimonials. There's a lot of people who are watching this who are in the challenge. So they will, um, uh, tell you about it. So Glow, go check it out. Go check out that challenge. John Clark says this challenge is worth your time because you are so worth it. LaWan's in the challenge. She says it's good. Kim's been there since February, loves it. Excellent. 
Um, Danny MacArthur, have people caught it again? And if so, is it bad the second time? So uh, the jury is still out on this, Danny. Uh, we heard about this possibility um, back in April with some South Koreans possibly taking it. And um, the uh, government was a little dismissive of it because we don't know exactly. What we needed to have is a confirmed positive coronavirus test followed by two confirmed negative tests and a period of time where they're feeling fine and then they get reinfected and have another positive test, okay? That's actually the criteria. So stories, anecdotes of my a co-worker had it and caught it again, or my husband got it and got better and caught it again. They don't really hold much weight in the scientific field. We, we have to have that other criteria. Now, what we are noticing, Miss Danny, is that antibodies called IgA and IgM are starting to disappear in eight to 10 weeks after coronavirus infection. So we don't know if that works. Um, but don't be alarmed. We still have the T cells and I, I'm going to do another talk later about testing and it's going to, um, uh, talk about that too. Uh, yin yang is in the weight loss challenge. Beverly loves it. She's learned a lot. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Jules, do kids have the lasting side effects? Um, there hasn't been, despite what the news says, there actually hasn't been, Jules, that many kids who've had coronavirus. And um, it seems to affect them less, uh, which is weird because a lot of times, you know, the younger kids get it worse. Uh, but for them, but they seem to be doing, doing better. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. Hey, Nick. Do you think we will have a vaccine by January 2021? I don't. Um, I, no, I'm not on the front. I'm not in that specialty to really say definitively. I know from just like what I see in the news, like you guys, that they are really ahead of schedule. Um, two companies have started their phase three trials, which is the last phase, 30,000 people. Uh, half get uh, placebo, half get the actual virus. And then they have to follow them out to see if there's a difference, uh, to see if it works. I am a little concerned that we might be rushing it. Not the data, not the creation of the vaccine, but the testing it for efficacy, but also long-term effects. That just takes time. And so today, let's just call this August, uh, August, and then you have to have people catch the virus or not catch it and have enough where you can have a statistical significance that will give you an answer. And then we have other lasting uh, questions about how long does that vaccine last for, right? So the short term, the teasing out of the data today's uh, let's call it August. So all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, you really need to have four, you know, I would say at least four months. And then once you say yes or no, they, the company's got to produce it and then we have to disperse it. And then we have to see how long it works and lasts. So, um, Glenda, I just did a video about kids going back to school, but, uh, for, uh, as a quick summary, uh, it, it, you shouldn't go back to my opinion is that you shouldn't go back to school. If you're in a hot spot, there are areas of our country that don't have hot spots that never really flared up. They might, they have under 20 cases. I think in that case, if you have a very good plan in place, then that would be fine. That would be fine. Shan, my girl, Shan, what's up? You're looking pretty. That's like, I like it. Uh, since the virus causes clotting, what are your thoughts on taking prophylactic low dose aspirin for after infected? Will it help long term? I will tell you that a lot of patients are being treated with low dose aspirin. Uh, I would say it probably doesn't hurt. Although, if you remember, Shan, back in the 80s and 90s, we tried to get a lot of people to take uh, an aspirin a day, taking that baby aspirin a day to protect your heart. And then we found out that. Um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of those benefits went away after 10 years. But in terms of COVID, um, I think that uh, it should be uh, okay. It wouldn't hurt, right? Um, Sheila Holman, 
Hey, Dr. V, how does COVID-19 affect people that have had bariatric surgery? You know, I think one of the best things that you did was to have bariatric surgery. Now, I want to group you into two groups. If you've lost the weight, you're at normal risk. If you've had bariatric surgery, but you haven't lost the weight yet, or you regain the weight and you're still BMI is over 30, your risk is still the same. If you've had an extreme bariatric surgery, one that has a lot of malnutrition, malabsorption, and you're malnourished, especially low levels of vitamin D, duh, duh, as in duck, duck, vitamin D, um, you're, you're at higher risk. Uh, so you want to make sure your immune system is, is strong. Um, all right. You're welcome. Uh, Cheryl. Yep. Mine says everything daily Facebook lives with Dr. V and you will change. That's just talking about the challenge. If you're interested in the challenge, let me put that up again real quick here. So you guys can see if you're interested in checking out the challenge, we will actually start um, opening it tomorrow, but it's uh, weightlosschallenge.com, weightlosschallenge.com. We, we talk about COVID every day. I do a daily Facebook live. I, uh, we do the mental side. It's really the mental side of the weight loss journey, keep you on focus. You don't have to have had the weight loss surgery, um, to, to benefit from it. What's up Tahiti? That's awesome. Um, but you, but I will tell you the mental side of the challenge, um, helps to calm your stress level, which thereby helps your immune system. We know that if that stress hurts the immune system and if you can remain calm, that helps the immune system. So we deal a lot with that. We talk about money to, to make sure that, that your money's not stressing you out, paying the bills, etc. cetera. Um, Mary, Mary Beth is in the challenge. So I know her and I get to know a lot of these patients really well, especially if they're active in the challenge. Not everybody's as active as I'd like, but Mary Beth is in our weekend week, weekly groups. We also, you can also sign up for weekly group sessions. So you're in a group of six to eight people, sometimes nine. And, um, and we, we have homework to do every week and we talk and discuss a topic, right? Um, Lawrence, your view on kids transmission of COVID. I did, um, a really good comprehensive video on kids going back to school and that includes the transmission of COVID. I'm almost done editing that down. It'll be on YouTube probably later tonight, Lawrence, but it's on my fan page, um, on Facebook. I know you're watching this from YouTube, but I basically said kids from 10 to 19 is the, actually the, the largest spreaders of COVID is kids from 10 to 19. So uh, not the young kids from 0 to 5, but 10 to 19. Uh, Danny, I am overweight, have MS, type 2 diabetes, severe sleep, and I'm in debation. Yep. You are very high risk. Stay safe. Money is all Amy. Man, I'm telling you, I, I'm so, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that the sooner people can do that, can, can get their head around that, the better off they're going to be. I do suffer, Brenda, from vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, a few other deficiencies, old bariatric surgery. So, um, yeah, you got to go, go, go get checked by your doctor. Um, get any sort of iron infusions or iron supplements or vitamin D supplementation and um, get healthy, get healthy for sure. Alvarez, Naomi, what do you think about the comments of the American frontline doctors about the medication as they say cures COVID? So they've been really debunked. So I wouldn't worry about them. That lady also thinks that, you know, um, there are the, you know, there are aliens and that there are demons that can impregnate you and stuff like that. What's up, Sergio? Why is this uh, virus very selective? I don't think it's selective. I, it doesn't really care. Uh, it, it is, um, um, you know, it, it, it has far reaching repercussions. Can newborns catch uh, and spread the virus? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Uh, more to come about that. Got COVID five weeks ago and still having after effects. James, stay safe, brother. Um, so stay safe. Uh, blood type A, the data is not real clear. Uh, I wouldn't worry, worry too much about that hype. Um, I think obesity, don't forget, remember, it's obesity. People sit there and go, blood types, Dr. V, but you're 250 pounds. <laughs> Take care of that first. Uh, smoking, so previous lung diseases, uh, old age, older age, um, 
uh, and obesity obviously is the, the big one, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, those are much, much, much more important than the blood type. Trust me. Right. Um, uh, is there a gender that gets more at risk? Well, I could tell you, but there's only a 50% chance I would be correct. Um, I've been on the record from early on, Peggy, that hydroxychloroquine does not work, does not work. And then, um, and then there have been studies to prove that. Elaine Perry, we had a baby in ICU that caught it in NICU. So hopefully they're good. Kelly Joe, autoimmune diseases absolutely puts you at risk, especially if you take a immune suppressing medication um, and I don't want to name them, but, um, but you know, you know, the ones they are because your doctors tell you that they, they can lower your immune system, especially for like things like surgery. Um, hi, Vitus. Uh, how about controlled diabetes, Dr. V? So, um, I, I, the, the studies do not indicate if they are controlled or not controlled diabetes or hypertension they were only looking at do you have it yes or no or do you not okay so my assumption would be then if it's not controlled i mean if it is controlled you're still at, at risk so um yeah joe demon impregnation <laughs> she that so um i don't see any questions about Super bugs, and so there you go. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, Remicade, obviously, is one of these um, autoimmune drugs that um, hurt your ability to heal. So, Susie, what's your opinion on getting surgery next month? Santa Clara County getting surgery in Fremont, California. So, um, you know. You have to watch it real closely. Uh, there's a good chance that um, they'll shut California down. Um, and uh, we'll see. Um, as long as you feel safe and as long as your surgeons feel safe doing it, then you just have to remember that it's not so much the hospital because a lot of hospitals aren't COVID hospitals. They might not have any COVID cases. They might have COVID cases. I don't know. Most of them taking precautions. Most of them are requiring you to have a um, COVID test. So they know that um, pretty much everybody who goes into that hospital is COVID negative. So that minimizes your chance. Um, but just remember that if you have surgery, and here's probably the key point, is after surgery, you're, you're gonna need people. You're gonna want people, somebody to be there to help you get around, get up, look at your incisions, bring you water, help you stay hydrated. You don't bounce back from this surgery like everybody says. Now you could, but even then the first few days are a little, can be a little bit tough. And so you'll need some help and support. So as long as you have that, um, or you tested them or you, you're pretty confident that they're negative. The only way to know that is if you have a test, then, um, you know, just make sure you have everything, uh, in, in place. Okay. Carrie Clark, what are your thoughts on mask face coverings? How they become mandatory this week in UK when in shops right now and not before? Because you're trying to keep your numbers down, Carrie. And yes, they work and you should be wearing them. And um, that's how um, you got past it. Why are people getting sick at parties? Social distancing, masks not helping those situations because they're not social distancing. They think they are, but trust me, there's always somebody who's gonna give you a hug or you think that they're gonna be safe. So to think that you're going to a party, you're not social distancing at a party. Um, all right. I am because it's worked for the rest of the world. What's with big tech censoring the frontline doctors at DC yesterday? Because they've been debunked and they're not, you don't even know if they're real doctors. And that one main doctor that's got all the press, she's been shown to be a little loony. Melissa Free, I'm curious, Dr. V, was COVID here a lot earlier than um, they thought? Probably not. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about that, but probably not. 
if you were sick in the winter in January, February, you most likely had influenza B. It was um, um, that type of B, that type of flu. Remdesivir has been shown to cut uh, hospital stay by about 30%, but um, so it slows your course. Um, so they're using it, but that means you gotta be really sick and you gotta be in a hospital, right? Um, what do you think about aerosol versus droplets? As far as we know, this virus is in droplets, which makes face mask coverings work. And, and um, yeah, so it works. Um, they can get aerosolized, but that's in rare situations. Uh, and we think like things like surgery, being on a vent, things like that. Um, should you get the flu shot? That's up to you. I don't. Uh, I'm relatively young and healthy, and um, I haven't had a flu shot for years. All right. Rob Hunt, cute picture, bud. In an otherwise healthy individual who only suffers from obesity, why are they so high risk? Restrictive lung disease and underlying, maybe possibly undiagnosed um, other comorbidities that you don't know about. So let me do this question real quick. Um, so we have treatments for tuberculosis. That's probably the main thing. Um, did you watch 2020 last night about COVID? I did not. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. All right. Sick in March for 21 days and I took the flu shot. The flu shot will not stop you from getting the coronavirus. That is a whole different other, other bug but I'm glad you're better. Do you recommend pregnant women to take yellow D to prevent breathing problems? I don't know what yellow D is. Uh, 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 uh. All right, so actually, you know what we need, guys? Uh, I've been approached by a company. I'm not here to sell you on anything, but um, it was very interesting. They have a rapid test, COVID rapid test that, um, you do a finger prick, it's a little finger prick, just like if you're checking your blood sugar. If you're a diabetic, you're used to checking your blood sugar. Yeah, it's a little tiny poke, you don't really feel it. You swipe it on this cartridge, it looks like, honestly, like a pregnancy test, you know? You put it on a little cartridge, you put a little drop of solution on there, 15 minutes you have a result. It's a blood test, so it's an antibody test, IgG and IgM. And um, they want to partner with me and uh, for me to promote it. And um, it has a 97% um, um, accuracy rate. Now, did you guys know that that PCR test, the nasal swab, the ones that you guys put up the nose is only 70% accurate, seven zero. So it's not the end all be all. You could get a negative test and still be positive, right? Um, so it's only 70% um, accurate. So this blood test, is 97% accurate. I asked them to show me this, the study, which compared it um, uh, versus all these other uh, all these other tests. So um, they are promoting it to companies to keep these companies open. You know, you can imagine like a meat plant or a warehouse. You don't want people getting sick, and if they do, you want to test them early, and you want to isolate them, and then test all the other exposed people and you can keep your business open basically restaurants schools etc i thought i was looking at their data and i was like dude why don't we promote this as a home test kit doc we can't do it because yada 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 there's blood but you're a doctor and i'm like it's just a finger prick like you would do diabetes stick but you guys understand that there's no reason to have to take a test and it takes 10 days to get results Comment if you've had a test and how long is it taking to get your results? Up to 14 days, there's no point of having a test. 10 days, no point of having a test. Seven days, no point. Because you could have been exposed before, you know, since then. Five days, no. At the most, three days before you get your results. At the most, and preferably under 48. So um, there's a company who approached me about having a COVID-19 blood test 
that would give you a result in 15 minutes you do at the comfort of your own home that you don't have to sit in line you don't have to find a testing center you don't have to be in your car with a full tank of gas and snacks so put test in the comment section actually put a one put a one in the comment section if you'd be interested in that test if you think i should do it i'm not trying to sell you on anything it is it costs money you're paying for your convenience and um but i i think it makes the most sense if you're worried about kids in school if you if you want to like have one of these school pods at your house where you bring in five kids from five families that you kind of trust and you can test them you know um and test the parents if the parents want to be there now you have real big safety you could use it if you wanted to go see grandma comment if you've never if you haven't seen grandma grandma hasn't seen grandbaby in three months well just finger test it just prick your finger put it on the test and start driving to grandma's house 15 minutes later you show up at the door ding look it's negative right and it's a it's like a pregnancy test it gives you the result there's no machine you don't have to assay it you don't have to spin it you don't have to do anything to it um and what you do with the results, it's up to you. You don't have to tell your employer. Um, but most companies, if you work for an employer, if you do test positive, they're gonna want you to go get one of these nasal swab tests just to confirm, to be official. So put a one in the comment section if you'd be interested in having or learning more about this swab test, this uh, home test, right? Uh, yeah, you'll if you're asymptomatic carrier, you'll turn out uh, positive. So 97%. Um, it's going to be a little bit, it'll be in that range, maybe a little bit more. I might do a special uh, for those people. So if you're interested, it's going to be in the $75 to $100 range for one test. I know that can be expensive for a family of like four, but gosh, you'd have the results right away. You um, would know safety profile. It's much more accurate. You're not shoving shit up your nose, you know? So uh, let me know. Um, it's gonna be in the $7,500 range. Um, and um, if I get, so here's a good question, hold on. Alice wants to know, is it FDA approved? There is no COVID test that's FDA approved, zero. There are no COVID tests that are FDA approved. They are all done under the Emergency Use Act. So um, it has emergency use. So it's FDA approved in that sense. It's on the list of approved tests, but no test is technically FDA approved. It's on, it's on the list. Um, so yeah, you think it's worth it? So excellent. Yeah, if you have the ability to get your results the next day and you wanna wait, that's fine. Um, the test kit has an expiration date. I, you know, actually I just got a box sample box yesterday and I want to say it's uh, 2021. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Um, yeah, so they sell, let me see somebody. Okay. So more than one. So, the company sells it in packs of five, 10 and 15. And the more you buy the cheaper. So you could get together with your family members and buy 10 of them, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, have it to test on, on people. Um, so lots of ones. That's great. I think it makes sense. I'm going to purchase a few and I'll probably do a video and, and, um, and show, uh, the test. What if I turned out positive? I think I might've caught it back in March. Actually. I had a night where I had a lot of, uh, chills. Uh, yeah. Bundle pricing. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Excellent. Have they done enough to know about false positive? Uh, you know, I'm going to, they're going to send me the paperwork. So I'll, I'll, I'll know about that. Um, yeah, it's it's all right. Emergent. Yes, yeah, it emergency use act. Thank you. <laughs> so accuracy rate 75, uh, 97 percent, 97 percent. So I know I didn't cuss at all today, huh? So um, cool. 
All right. Thank you guys very much. I will be back again tomorrow with another COVID update and um, I'll see you then. Thank you so much. Uh, remember, we got to all get together and um, hey, I appreciate there really these um, last uh, uh, few uh, videos. There really haven't been many trolls, really no real negative comments. I appreciate this community so much, you know, this keeping this COVID data positive so we, we know and uh and we can learn and we can get over this together um prayers goes out to the um doctors and nurses and uh aides and uh, people they're working um also our teachers who are really stressing out and school administrators right now and workers um who are trying to figure out the best thing to do for our kids i have i have two kids two daughters myself and so blessings to them for sure um you know, I like to end on this point in every video, which is, you know, they often say that the doctors and nurses are the front line, but they're not. They're the back line. We're the front line. You and me, you know, the average citizens, the people who uh, need to do our part, mask up, wear gloves if you want to, use hand wash, social distance. We are the front line. So hashtag we are the front line. Because this virus is going to go away depending on how we behave, not how the doctors and nurses treat us once we get sick. This will go away depending on how you and I behave. So we are the front line. Hashtag we are the front line. Love you guys. Be very safe. See you next time. Bye now.